I remember growing up, my father, he was so wonderful. He used to allow my brothers and I to take turns cutting his hair. And as soon as you start, he would just fall asleep. Like when we give him a massage, as soon as you touch his feet, he falls asleep. I was a very, very naughty teenager. I was cheeky and full of mischief. And the moment it was my turn and he fell asleep, this was in the 80s, so punk era was reigning. I would do one mohawk for him. I would shave both sides and leave this one in the middle, and he's just sleeping away. And so desperately wanted to wake him up and say, can I paint it purple? But it was really so wonderful. How many play with their spouse? Today, my husband and I, yes, you may look at me, big fat mama, yes, we race, and I can run. And we play hide and seek. I look for his trouble and I run. And because of my size, there aren't too many places I can hide in the house. But by the time I am caught, the screams, I think even my neighbors hear it. Sometimes the children start to shout, calm down, you people in the house. We show affection openly. And I think sometimes they're even jealous of us. But we are teaching them how they should relate with their spouse and how they should raise their own children. We pray together with our children. We let them hear what we pray for, and we take turns to make dua. We teach them to have a strong love for Allah and only fear offending him or displeasing him. However, we teach them not to ever fear shaitan or any jinn out there because they have absolutely no power over them. So they shouldn't give that power to them. They shouldn't give them permission to have power over them. We eat together as a family with absolutely no technology around. Yes, we put off our phones, keep them away, and we sit with no interruptions just to chat. So we talk and we talk a lot. From an early age, we started to talk about boy-girl relationship. We run a school and what's so disturbing is the trend that they're getting more aware of members of the opposite gender from a younger and younger age. And then we talk about inappropriate physical contact with members of the opposite gender. But today, the biggest fear is contact with members of the same gender. Why? Because they are growing up in an era where bad is made to look okay. Bad is made to look normal. So we talk and we talk a lot. And we listen to them. Even the silliest things they say, we listen. Why? Because we know if we don't, they're going to find somebody who's ready to talk and listen to them. I had to do more research on effective communication and effective listening so that I can speak to them in their language and connect with them. We let them see how we communicate. My husband and I have important discussions in their presence so that they will learn. However, we never ever fight in the presence of our children. But we teach them about the ethics of disagreement. We teach them about effective communication and effective listening. Then we make sure they watch how we take care of our parents. We visit our parents a lot. We give our parents time. Some live in a different city or town from where their parents are. But please never neglect that bond that should always stay together because they need us more than ever at this time. Be sensitive to their feelings. Show them affection and better know, do research on their best love language. Why? Because you may be doing something you think they appreciate and they want something totally different. My children see me today putting my head on my mother's lap. They see me give my parents big hugs and kisses. And they hear or watch how I listen to the stories, stories that I have memorized. But every time my parents tell me these stories, I act like, I'm hearing it for the first time. As a team, as a family, we discuss how we will deal with aged parents. My father is about 93, my mother is 78, but she has dementia as well as Parkinson's, so she's quite ill. But Allah has blessed me with a gift, a husband who realizes sometimes that I am stressed because I'm not able to give them the kind of time I want to. So he and the children take turns to go hang out with my parents and give them company and chat with them. Thank your parents for the seeds they have planted in you. Pray on their behalf. Pray for them. Do sadaqah on their behalf and fast for your parents. And if your parents didn't do a good job, if, they, if you feel they dropped the ball, for the sake of Allah, please forgive them. It will lighten your load. 
everything in our relationship should be balanced. Relationship with our spouse, our children, and our loved ones. Fulfill your obligations to all, but don't neglect one for the other. And let your children join you when you go to visit friends or neighbors or loved ones. We do acts of charity together, community service. We plant trees together. But please, if, don't be offended if I say this. Please, please, please put down your phones and make family feel that they matter. A lot of us today are guilty of giving the unseen, those social media friends, more priority than our loved ones. We spend, based on research, no more than 25 minutes in a week on a decent family discussion. Only 25 minutes a week today. And we are so busy, yes, but we chose to get married. We chose to have children, and we have obligations, and we will answer to Allah for them. But we can create time during the drive to school, during bedtime, that's a great time to sit, talk, tell stories. Meal times with no technology, just to sit together and eat. And after prayers, during walks. The thing is, you just have to create the time because we create time to spend time with our friends. And somehow, we are able to spend hours on our phone. These are invaluable seconds that could be spent bonding with our loved ones. But be careful allowing too much time spent on television, on video games, and chatting on social media. Yes, it's a convenient babysitter, but it slows down the brain and promotes passive behavior. Social media has become a great asset, but it's also become a huge burden. We see families being destroyed today because of social media. We pick up our phones the moment we wake up, even before we pray, before we say hello to our loved ones. While we're eating, we even sleep with our phones. And it stops us from being content. Why? Because wrongly, we see better versions of what we think is the dunya. Better versions of a car, a house, and a family. And all of a sudden, we are no longer content. It starts to lower our own self-esteem. In our home, we've created boundaries and guidelines and controls for everyone. If you look at how you are using social media today, that is what you are teaching your children. I have been in a home where I've seen a parent communicating with their child in the same home using social media, and they will mirror what they see. If you don't control social media, social media will replace you. You really have to stand up and take control. And so many are doing a lot today to do with developing a bond and strengthening the relationship in their homes. Please continue. But like my father always says, improve upon it. Improve upon it together. Treat your home like a garden, like a team sport where everybody is having fun. Everybody is on the same side. There's mutual commitment, loyalty, gaining and growing and giving and guarding. One thing that is important about parenting is that we should be conscious of why we had those children. Sometimes we make the mistake of having them so that we can live our dreams through them, those things we couldn't achieve when we were younger. We end up dominating them and dictating how they will live their lives. You're going to be a doctor when you grow up. You're going to be an engineer. Maybe that is what was done to us growing up. But if you're going to be honest with yourself, some people are miserable today because they didn't have a choice in what they would do. Or sometimes we do everything for our children. We want them to have an easy life. We don't want them to go through the difficulties that we went through. The things that we didn't have, we want them to have. They grow up, unfortunately, with this sense of entitlement, like you owe them, or society owes them. They want an easy life. We help our kids to live, but we don't prepare them to live without us because we do everything for them. They depend on us for everything. Another thing that really concerns me today is that children are not growing up hearing enough of those, that beautiful two-letter word, no. They say, I want. We say, you got it. They don't want, we don't want them to be mad at us. We don't want to be, feel guilty that we didn't give them what they want. And what do they want? They just want the latest so that they can fit in. The worst is children today are not growing up using words like excuse me, please, and thank you anymore. We are doing our children a great disservice in the name of love. 
So think about your children right now. Think about your spouse and your family. If you were not here today, what difference would it make? Are you teaching them to be independent? Many of us don't teach our children the value of hard work, service, sober. They get so used to receiving and collecting. Like many of you, though, you are raising your children to be well-disciplined, to have good manners, good adab. You teach them how to speak. We make a big fuss in how our children talk to one another, how they talk to us, how they talk to people. We teach them good manners in how they even relate with the help. They see I hug the help. They see I chat with them. And they realize that everybody is where they are based on Allah's will. And Allah is testing us. So issues to do with respect manners is so important to inculcate with ch into children. Having said that, sometimes you do absolutely everything in your power to get this thing right. But your children may still go astray. Just because they grew up in a Muslim home doesn't mean they're going to be practicing Muslims. You gave birth to them, but you didn't give birth to their character. It all boils down to individual choice. But don't be a hardliner. Don't turn them off and don't turn them away. I got turned off growing up because I grew up in a very religious home. I learned the Quran, I learned its translation and in its interpretation. But because I was judged, society had expectations that I'm supposed to behave like so-and-so's daughter. I was condemned a lot condemned about my dressing, my speech, my friends. And because of that, everything was haram. Oh, what you're doing is haram. Oh, Mariam, you're going to burn in hell with this thing. So I rebelled. I got allergic to anything to do with Islam. I went for almost four years in my early 20s where I stopped praying. And it wasn't until my late 20s that I rediscovered Islam. But there are so many more out there like me who are Muslims by chance. They were born in it. But today I'm a Muslim by choice. And each day I'm learning. The seeds that were planted by my parents from a very young age are what are the ones I'm seeing germinating in me. That's why I always say I'm a student, I'm not a scholar. But even some of the prophets couldn't guide all their children. So what we need to do is to remember that Allah says our wealth and our kids are at a trial for us. So we keep on praying and keep on planting seeds. And in addition to learning the Quran, teach your children the message of the Quran, the context of the Quran. Don't raise blind followers. Because you say read, they read. Because you say pray, they pray. This is blind following. Teach them the why behind the injunctions of the Quran. Teach them that it's very important they memorize the Quran and pronounce properly. However, it is more important for them to be conscious of Allah, to have taqwa, and apply the lessons of the Quran. Don't forget, when it comes to knowledge of Allah, shaitan has more knowledge than any of us do of Allah. Shaitan knows Allah better than any of us, but what he's missing is taqwa. What he's missing is guided actions. There are scholars that know aqidah and tawheed, but when you look at some of their character, that is where there is a big question mark. Again, it's about the knowledge coming to life. It's about Allah being our compass. So show your children Islam in motion and hold on tight to that rope that links you, holds you to your children and hold on tight to Allah's rope. So with all my roles and responsibilities in the home, as a spouse, as a parent, I try to reflect at the end of the day to see whether I'm on track. So I do those, that gar talk with myself because those things I want to see won't happen by accident. So I try to live my life deliberately. And I reflect at the end of the day. And I appreciate everything that Allah has given me in a gratitude journal and in a diary. I ask myself, what did I do to grow? How did I learn? Could I have done anything differently? How did I add value to my family? What seeds did I plant? I try to remember that I'm meant to be a cheerleader to my children and to my spouse, and I reflect on that. My final words on parenting for the fathers in the house. How you treat your spouse is how you are teaching your sons to treat theirs. Your daughters are learning from you how they are meant to be treated by a man. Teach your sons to treat women with dignity and respect. 
Teach your sons the important qualities to look for in spouse selection and the process. Raise boys who will not just be boys. Raise boys who know that they are responsible and will be held accountable for their actions and inactions. Who understand what it means to be a real man. Raise boys who will model Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam to the mothers, to the first schools, to the ones who educate a nation. Raise boys who grow up to treat women with respect and respect themselves, who learn to clean, cook, and do things for themselves, who are not raised to believe that women are meant to serve them as glorified house girls. Raise girls who know their role and worth in society. Raise girls who will preserve their dignity and guide your daughters in the best spouse selection. If you are so fortunate enough to see them get married, please don't interfere. If I may ask for just a few more minutes. If you are so fortunate to see your children get married, please don't interfere. Don't make them take sides. Don't make them feel guilty. Don't make life miserable for them or for their spouse. Then sometimes in spite of all your good efforts, divorce occurs. But parenting is for life. Don't make them your lawyers. Don't make them your psychiatrist. One day they will resent you. My final words on how we build a beautiful Muslim home. My husband and I and the children treat our home as a thriving garden. We put a fence around it and we guard it jealously. Everybody is planting seeds. Everybody is nurturing. Everybody is fertilizing, adding water and sunlight. And everybody is involved in removing weeds. Weeds starting with ourselves. We smell, alhamdulillah, the beautiful, fragrant, fragrant flowers that comes from our efforts. And we get to taste the beautiful fruit from our labor. The fact that we are all here today means we want to be better. Like I said, I'm a student just like you. But just because we attend lecture upon lecture, read books upon books, they are so far from sufficient if it doesn't help us become a better parent so we will be a better person. If it doesn't help us become a better spouse, a better Muslim, and if it does not translate into actions. We have more access today than ever before to knowledge and information. We have great scholars at our fingertips in our homes telling us all sorts of good things and enlightening us on Islam. But the world is not getting better. We are seeing more and more marriages break down, more absentee parents, more dysfunctional children, children that are hooked on drugs and other things. What many are suffering from is the discipline to apply the knowledge and bring it to life. So let the gifts, let the seeds that these great scholars have planted in us, the fertilizer, the sunlight, the water, nurture our hearts and our relationship and produce beautiful, delicious fruit. I am a student on a lifelong journey to learn and grow and contribute and be the best Muslim, be the best spouse, and be the best parent I can be. Every day I have an opportunity to turn a new page, and every day I have an op opportunity to write or rewrite my story. May what we write in our books, the deeds that we act, serve as a witness for us in the life to come. May our books be presented to us in our right hands. May Allah bless you all.